will come to order. Members, please take your seats. Sergeant Arms. The House is now in session. All persons not entitled to privileges on the floor, please retire to the gallery. The members will rise and be led in prayer by the Honorable G. Paul Nardo. Clerk. Come on. Uh, clerk of the Virginia House of Delegates and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, led by the gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Let us pray. Almighty God, who is known by many names, today we gather united in awe at your divine majesty and in wonder at the beauty of your creation, especially during this winter season. We humbly beseech you to bless, preserve, and keep safe all delegates those who were able to make it here, as well as those unable to do so because of the weather. Now and always and in this transitory life, stir up our faith, and please help us to be ever mindful of our calling to love one another, serve you, and to work together for a better, safer, and more prosperous commonwealth. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. The members will answer the roll call by indicating their presence on the electronic voting board. We don't have it. <laughs> Clerk will close the roll. Mr. Speaker, a quorum is present. Pursuant to House Rule 3, I've examined and approved the Journal of the House of Delegates for January 21st, 2016. Motions and resolutions under Rule 39 are now in order. Does the clerk have any announcements or communication? Not at this time, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Alexandria, Ms. Herring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a request. The gentlewoman has the floor. Thank you. Uh, let the journal reflect that my seatmate, the gentlewoman from Fairfax, is away due to pressing personal business. Journal will so reflect. Thank you. The uh, gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a motion. Gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker, I would move that we take by for the day House bills on second reading regular calendar. If I could speak to that motion. Gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker, I think with uh, enough members missing, we wanted to make sure that uh, those bills obviously have a, a number of no votes on several of them, so we thought we'd take the whole category by, so that's what the motion does. The gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox, moves Mr. that Speaker. the House bills on second reading regular calendar go by for the Mr. Day. Speaker. The uh, gentleman from uh, Charlotte. Charlottesville. Well, gentleman yield for a question. Gentleman yield. I yield. I, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask the gentleman if he'd be so kind to include in that block HB 52, which is on regular, uh, uncontested today, but uh, we need to take we need to put it on regular second uh, for purposes of an extension. That's fine. We can amend it to that. Thank you. W which one was that on second reading? Uncontested. HB 52, I think, on page four. Okay. Okay. General Colonel Heights, Mr. Cox moves that um, House Bill 52 and the House Bills on second reading regular calendar go by for the day. As many as favor that motion will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is agreed to. 
the gentleman from Giles, Mr. Yost. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for the purpose of request. Gentleman has floor. Mr. Speaker, I, along with the gentleman from Caroline, Delegate Orock, and other members of the Fredericksburg delegation, request um, permission to take center aisle. Gentleman has uh, permission. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman from Giles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, members of the House, last week the General Assembly jointly passed House Joint Resolution 126 commending Penelope Ward Kyle, and today I have the honor of officially presenting it to her on the House floor. On June 1, 2005, Penelope Kyle became Radford University's sixth and first female president. Prior to her appointment at Radford, she had more than 30 years of experience in state government, higher education, and the private sector. And I will note, between her and President Hurley, who we will recognize shortly, they have over 60 years in service to the Commonwealth. Since her arrival, Radford University has seen unprecedented growth and received more than $330 million in capital projects. In 2008, RU opened the state-of-the-art Covington Center for Visual and Performing Arts, and in 2012, we opened a new building for the College of Business and Economics. The university also has renovated several major campus buildings and recently opened a new student fitness and wellness center, and we are eagerly awaiting the opening of our new Center for the Sciences, the new College for Humanities and Behavioral Sciences buildings. But it doesn't stop there. During President Kyle's tenure, approval was secured from the Commonwealth for Radford to offer its first doctoral degree, the Doctor of Psychology and Counseling Psychology. More recently, Radford University has sought and gained approval for additional doctorates in physical therapy and nursing practice, and RU now offers 67 degree programs and two certificates at the undergraduate level and 22 degree programs at the graduate level. In closing, Mr. Speaker, President Kyle has created a lasting legacy on Radford University's campus, and as a double alumni, I am immensely grateful for her accomplishments and dedication. I think her tenure at RU is best summed up in the university's creed, selected by RU's first president, Dr. John McConnell, from an 1852 quotation by Daniel Webster. If we work upon marble, it will perish. If we work upon brass, time will efface it. If we rear temples, they will crumble to dust. But if we work upon men's mi immortal minds, if we imbue them with high principles, with the just fear of God and love of their fellow men, we engrave on those tablets something which no time can efface and which will brighten and brighten to all eternity. It is my pleasure to officially present her with this joint resolution from the House. The um, gentleman from Caroline, Mr. Orrock. Mr. Speaker, I would ask if there are other University of Mary Washington or Mary Washington College alumni in the chamber uh, and all those representing the greater Fredericksburg area, if they could join me here in the center aisle at this time. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, it's my great honor this morning or this afternoon now to represent and present on behalf of the Speaker, uh, Dr. Rick Hurley. Uh, Dr. Hurley is retiring as president of the University of Mary Washington. His tenure there at the university began when it was a college, and he served as chief financial officer during that time, executive vice president, and acting president. And he did such a good job of acting as president, they actually made him the president. Uh, he has just been a stalwart part of the Fredericksburg community. Uh, he was there on staff at the time that my late wife got her degree from the college. I don't know if you're aware of her degree from there. Um, but thank you for all the help you provided and that paperwork getting through. Appreciate it. So anyway, but uh, Dr. Hurley has just been a tremendous asset to the entire Fredericksburg community and the University of Mary Washington in particular, that he saw them largely through the transition from college to university status. They are ranked 
nationally as one of the finest small public institutions in, uh, in the entire country. They are a tremendous benefit to all of the Commonwealth. We're deeply going to miss you, Dr. Hurley, but thank you so much for all that you've done for the university and for higher education as a whole in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we wish you the best in your future life. Thank you. Presidents uh, Kyle and Hurley, we are honored that you are with us today, and we thank you so much for um, your many, many years of service to the Commonwealth, and we hope that you enjoy your time uh, in retirement well-deserved. Thank you again for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Oh, money bag. <laughs> the um, gentleman from Bedford, Ms. Byron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a request. The gentleman has floor. I'd like to request that the journal reflect that my seatmate from Prince William is absent due to pressing personal business. The journal is over flight. The uh, gentleman from Salem, Mr. Habib. Ms. Speaker, I rise for a request. The gentleman has floor. I made the journal reflect that the, well, my seatmate, the gentleman from Loudoun, is away today and pressing personal business. The journal is over flight. The um, gentleman from Halifax, Mr. Edmonds. Mr. Speaker, rise for a request. The gentleman has the floor. Let the general reflect that the general lady from Westmoreland is away today on pressing personal business. General is over flight. The uh, gentleman from Portsmouth, Mr. James. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a point of personal privilege. The gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker and members of the House, with all of us preparing for the national disaster last week, many of people in the this chamber as well as at home missed a major announcement for the Commonwealth. Last Thursday, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development announced that Virginia will receive $120.5 million from the National Disaster Resilient Competition out of $1 billion that was competitively awarded nationwide. This is one of the largest discretionary federal grants in Virginia's history. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members of the body, the flooding we experienced this past weekend in Hampton Roads is unfortunately all too common, even with the major storm systems that are in front of us. I'd like to commend Governor McAuliffe as well as our congressional delegation for having the foresight to tenaciously pursue this federal grant, which will assist Hampton Roads in protecting our citizens, businesses, and strategic military assets. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Gentleman from Hampton, Ms. Ward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a request and a point of personal privilege. The woman has the floor. First, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the journal reflect that the gentlewoman from Richmond is away today on pressing personal business. The journal will so reflect. And next, Mr. Speaker, I am back. <laughs> and not a day too soon, because today many of you may realize it's actually National Multiple Sclerosis Society Awareness Day right here in the Capitol. But due to the recent storm, the MS acti activists were unable to meet with us at the General Assembly today. But uh, they are reaching out to us online and by way of email and social media to advocate for our caregivers and to ask that we close the health insurance gap. Multiple sclerosis is an unpre unpredictable, often disabling disease of the central nervous system that disrupts the flow of information within the brain and between the brain and the body. Some of the symptoms range from numbing, numbness and tingling to blindness and paralysis. The progress, the severity and specific symptoms of MS and any one person cannot be predicted, but because of advances in research and treatment, we are leading to a better understanding and moving to a world closer from uh, multiple sclerosis. There are 2.3 million individuals worldwide and 12,000, and I like to say 12,001 people right here in the Commonwealth living with multiple sclerosis. And just on the personal note, 
many of you may have remembered some four years ago, I stood here on this floor in about four inch high, high heel shoes. And I just boldly proclaim that I may have MS, but MS shall never have me. Well. My message is a little bit different this year. After a week that I had last week, and my message now is, MS does whatever MS wants to do. And, but with the good health insurance that we have and cutting edge medication that I'm able to receive, I have been able to receive what I need to pull myself through this flare up. So my message now may be, although MS did what it wanted to do last week, this week I'm back and I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. MS is messing with the wrong person. <laughs> the gentleman from Lynchburg, Mr. Garrett. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a request, sir. The gentleman may state it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may the general reflect that my seat mate, the gentleman from Smith, uh, Delegate Campbell, is away today on pressing personal business. The general will so reflect. I thank the speaker. The gentleman from Frederick, Mr. Collins. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a request. The gentleman has floor. I request that the general reflect the gentleman from Prince William County, Delegate Marshall, is away on pressing personal business. General so reflect. <laughs> Gen gentleman from Suffolk, Mr. Morris. Mr. Speaker, I rise for a request. The gentleman has floor. Please let the general reflect that my seatmate, the gentleman from Stafford, is away on pressing personal business. General so reflect. The uh, gentleman from Arlington, Mr. Lopez. Speaker, I rise for an announcement. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, due to extreme weather events uh, affecting health, the economy, and uh, outside advocates' attendance, the Virginia Environment Renewable Energy Caucus will not be meeting this, this afternoon and will be meeting next week. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The uh, gentleman from Fairfax, Mr. Lemonian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for the purpose of a request. The gentleman has the floor. I request that the journal reflect that my seatmate, the gentleman from Fairfax, is away on pressing personal business. The journal so reflect. Gentleman from Virginia Beach, Mr. Villanueva. Mr. Speaker, I rise for our introduction. The gentleman has the floor. We are honored to have with us in the gallery today the, one of the Commonwealth's largest regional transit advocacy groups called the Hampton Roads Public Transportation Alliance. Hampton Roads Public Transportation Alliance mission is to improve connectivity, quality of life, and economic competitiveness by way of a balanced multimodal regional transportation system. Ladies and gentlemen, please give them, give them a warm house welcome. Pleased to have the members from the Hampton Roads uh, Transportation Alliance with us. We thank you for your commitment to uh, your community and to the Commonwealth. Thank you. The gentleman from Charlottesville, Mr. Toscano. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a point of personal privilege. Gentleman has floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. A top priority of this governor and of this legislature is job creation and economic growth. And how fortunate it is to have a bipartisan initiative that we can all work on. Now you might ask me why this is a bipartisan initiative. Well, let me tell you why. You know, Republicans and Democrats have been with the governor for a lot of these rollouts of job creation announcements. To cut ribbons, to issue press releases, to make statements, to celebrate. And the reason for this is because all of these announcements are about our communities. They're about making our communities better. They're about making our neighbors have opportunities they have, haven't had to get a living wage. And they're all about helping us 
keep our children and our grandchildren in our community so they don't have to move away looking for jobs. Now recently, a number of leg very legitimate questions have been raised on this floor about an economic development uh, project that apparently went south and that the governor and the administration is now trying to get the money back that was uh, provided to that project as part of their clawback procedures, which we've embraced here in this chamber. And at the same time, the governor is trying to put into place various additional procedures that will make the system work better. But make no mistake about it, if you look at all these announcements, they're pretty incredible. In Mecklenburg County, Microsoft, an investment of uh, $340 million, 90 jobs, that project is underway. In Henry County, another $7.25 million, 29 jobs. This is a manufacturing operation that is going to be great for that county. Monogram Foods, also in Henry County. I don't know where Ward Armstrong is, but he's probably celebrating this as well. 36 million jobs, 36 million dollars in capital investment, 200 jobs. Henrico County has McKeeson. Uh, K2M in Loudoun County, that's 28 million dollars of private sector investment for 97 jobs. In Pulaski County, 25 million dollars of private investment, 69 jobs. All of these companies are involved in manufacturing, advanced manufacturing that create good jobs. And that's why people are embracing what this governor and what this legislature is trying to do. The question still remains, what about these incentives? incentives? Should we keep them going? And let me t give you a couple reasons why. First, Virginia has a strong record with incentives. We're the model of a lot of states in the country. That's not to say we can't make it better, but it is to say we've done a really good job. Um, only a very small number of these investments have failed over time. I think in Governor McDonald's administration, there might have been nine. There have been previous administrations that have had others fail. This governor has had one. We need to improve the process to make sure none of them fail, but realize this. Anytime you're dealing with the private sector, anytime you're dealing with investments, anytime you're dealing with business projects, those projects may fail. That's the nature of capitalism. Some of these work, some of them don't. Our role as legislators is to make sure the vetting process is appropriate, and that's what this governor is trying to do. The incentives train, shall we say, has left the station. And we need to make sure that we lay down the appropriate rails so that train doesn't leave the rails. And I think that's what this legislature and this governor is wanting to do. So our challenge, I think, is as we consider investing taxpayer dollars, we rely on three principles. Due diligence, transparency, and accountability. And if we work through those priorities, we will have better economic development projects in the future. And I know the governor and his administration is committed to working with us to make it so. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, our economic challenges are substantial, but our opportunities are great. And if we work together in a transparent and accountable way, our citizens will greatly appreciate what they have coming to them in the form of new jobs and new capital investment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there further motions or resolutions under Rule 39? If not, the clerk will call the calendar. Calendar for the Virginia House of Delegates for Monday, January 25th, page one of the printed calendar. House bills on third reading uncontested calendar. House bills third reading uncontested calendar. House bill 221, page two. House bill 222, 330, 337, 386, 579, 730. 
8. Shall the bills pass? Clerk will close the roll. Ayes 91, no 0. Ayes 91, no 0. The bills are passed. Turning to page 4 of the printed calendar, House Bill on third reading regular calendar. House Bill 415, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the code relating to Virginia Board for People with Disabilities, Powers, and Duties. Shall the bill pass? <laughs> Clerk will close the roll. Ayes 91, no 0. Ayes 91, no 0. The bill is passed. Continuing with the calendar, House Bill 20, excuse me, House Bills on Second Reading, Uncontested Calendar. House Bills on Second Reading, Uncontested Calendar. House Bill 20, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the code relating to the excise tax on peanuts. Report for the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The gentleman from Hopewell, Mr. Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House, this is a self assessment on peanuts, peanut farmers, on peanuts that are grown and sold in Virginia. I hope it would be a pleasure to House to pass the bill. Mr. Speaker. The uh, gentleman from uh, Spotsylvania, Mr. Cole. Uh, would the gentleman yield for a question? Will the gentleman yield? I yield. The gentleman yields. Uh, uh, what exactly is this bill doing to that assessment? Is it increasing it or lowering it? No, no. And this was passed back in for 15 cents. The, the 30 cents per 100 pounds was passed in July, uh, July 1st of 2010. It was extended until July 1st of, of uh, and we're extending it to July 1st of 2021. That's all we're doing. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, you yeah, you. follow you. Uh, so it's just extending a sunset? That's correct. All right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 52 has been moved to the regular calendar and is by for the day. House Bill 114, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the Code of Virginia relating to warning signs at agritourism locations. Report for the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources with amendments. Gentleman from uh, Virginia Beach, Mr. Knight. Mr. Speaker, I move the amendments. Questions on adoption of the committee amendments. As many as favor that motion will say aye. Those opposed, no. The amendments are agreed to. The gentleman from Virginia Beach. Mr. Speaker, House Bill 114 allows signs at agritourism locations to say warning or attention. I move the bill be engrossed and passed to its third reading. House Bill 115, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the code relating to diversion of commodity fund unexpended balances. Report for the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The gentleman from Virginia Beach, Mr. Knight. Mr. Speaker, House Bill 115 keeps the executive branch from sweeping commodity checkoff account monies into the general fund. These monies belong to these commodities groups like... Uh, Delegate Ingram was just talking about the self-assessments, so uh, we just want to keep these monies to where the executive branch can't sweep our monies of us folks that are in the commodities groups. So I move the House engross the bill and pass to its third reading. House Bill 123, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the Code of Virginia relating to real estate loans, mortgage applications, reported from the Committee on Commerce and Labor. John from Danville, Mr. Marshall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, House, uh, House Bill 123 is a bill brought to you by the State Corporation Commission. It amends the Virginia Code relating to lenders making a, an arranging loan secured by a first mortgage or first deed of trust on owner-occupied uh, residential real estate. Uh, the need for this amendment is due to new federal rules which require that the closing disclosure reflect the actual terms of the transaction. Thus, the rate in terms must be locked in at least three days prior to the uh, to the uh, um, moving forward on the uh, on the uh, mortgage, so I uh, ask to move this to uh, engross the bill and move it to its third reading. House Bill 124, a bill to amend and reenact several sections of the Code of Virginia relating to mortgage lenders and mortgage brokers, licenses and reports. Board for the Committee on Commerce and Labor. The gentleman from Danville, Mr. Marshall. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, House, House Bill 124 is also brought to you by the State Corporation Commission. And this proposal amends the uh, code to clearly state that a mortgage company and branch licenses will expire at the end of each calendar year unless renewed. The mo na nationwide mortgage license system, which Virginia uses to license mortgage companies and branches, already requires companies and branch license renewal every year. And this uh, legislation will just uh, get uh, Virginia in uh, under na nationwide mortgage license. I move that we engross the bill and move it to his third reading. House Bill 125, a bill to amend the Code of Virginia relating to mortgage loan originators, inactive licenses. Report from the Committee on Commerce and Labor. The Honorable Danville, Mr. Marshall. <clears throat> again, Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you. Uh, and this bill is again brought to you by the Straight Corporation Commission. And uh, House Bill 125 would add a new section, Chapter 17, which will allow mortgage loan originators to obtain, keep, and renew their license in an inactive status under certain circumstances. While a mortgage loan originator is in inactive status, he or she will not be allowed to conduct business as a, a mortgage loan originator. Without this amendment, a licensed mortgage loan originator may be subject to a license suspension, uh, revoke, uh, revocation, or renewal if the uh, MLO is not covered by a security bond for, for uh, such time. I uh, move that we um, engross the bill and move it to its third reading. Thank you. House Bill 208, a bill to amend the Code of Virginia relating to development and implementation of tributary plans. Board of the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. General Fairfax, Mr. Bolivar. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, House Bill 208 completely eviscerates an entire section of the Code of Virginia. Um, actually, it's just a cleanup bill, um, a Chesapeake Bay cleanup bill. Uh, back in 2000, we had the 2000 Chesapeake Bay Agreement, and that set up a process to develop and implement tributary strategy plans. Uh, under the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, we're now uh, doing watershed implementation plans. Uh, we started the process of moving forward from those tributary plans to Chesapeake uh, implementation plans last year, and this simply uh, completes that process. So I move that we um, engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. House Bill 440, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the Code of Virginia relating to the Impaired Waters Cleanup Plan, Annual Progress Report. Report Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. The gentleman from Prince William, Mr. Langefelter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, House Bill 440 is an update to the Impaired Waters Cleanup Plan that we passed several years ago. It required two reports per year. <clears throat> To the, to the General Assembly. We're now taking that to one report per year. We don't need that many. And it is due on the 1st of November. I move that we, move, I, I move that we pass the bill and move it to a third reading. Turn to page eight of the printed calendar. House Bill 476, a bill to amend and reenact two sections of the code relating to requiring submission of animal intake policy. Report of the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and uh, Natural Resources. Jonathan Campbell, Mr. Ferris. Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 476 asked the state veterinarian's office to add the intake policy of private animal shelters to their yearly reports that these animal shelters turn in to the state veterinarian. I hope it'll be the pleasure of the body to engross the bill and pass it to his third reading. Thank you. House Bill 514, a bill to amend section of the Code of Virginia relating to uh, the Governor's Agriculture and Forestry Industries Development Fund, commercially harvested wild fish and shellfish, Port of the Agriculture, Chesapeake and Natural Resources with a substitute. General Fergusson, Mr. Landis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, first I'd like to move the adoption of the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute. Questions on adoption of the committee substitute. As many as favor that motion will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The substitute is agreed to. General from Augusta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House, House Bill 514, committee substitute, clarifies that the Agriculture, Forestry, and D Industries Development Fund can also apply to businesses who commercially harvest wild fish and wild shellfish. This will allow the watermen and fishermen in those businesses to be able to apply and qualify for the AFID fund. Mr. Speaker, I move the House engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. House Bill 691, a bill to amend and reenact a section of the code relating to reporting requirements for work-related hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye. Report from the Committee on Commerce and Labor. The gentlewoman from Richmond City, Ms. Carr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This House Bill 691 uh, simply uh, conforms the uh, 
Virginia regulations to uh, federal regulations. It's a, a request of the Department of Labor. House Bill 699, a bill to amend and reenact several sections of the Code of Virginia relating to the production of industrial hemp. Order for the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake and Natural Resources with a substitute. Gentlewoman from Tame City County, Ms. Pogge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the committee substitute. The question is on adoption of the committee substitute. As many in favor of that motion will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Substitutes agree to the gentlewoman from James City County. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. HB 699 is the next step to a process we passed last year allowing cultivation of industrial hemp for research programs. HB 699 allows Virginia to join 26 other states that have passed legislation to create a permitting process that would allow licensees to begin commercial cultivation only upon removal by federal law of industrial hemp from the Controlled Substance Act. I move the bill be engrossed and passed to its third reading. And Mr. Speaker, House Bill 734, a bill to amend and reenact several sections of the code relating to noxious weeds. Report for the Committee on Agriculture, Chesapeake, and Natural Resources. I thought we were just talking about that. <laughs> General Marlins, Mr. Hope. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 734 changes the definition of noxious weeds and improves the process by which a weed can be considered to be noxious. Hope you the pleasure of the body <laughs> to, pass, to engross the bill and pass it on to its third reading. Gentlemen, Mr. Vaney, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise for a motion. Gentlemen, state it. On uh, page four, may House Bill 20, and on page six, may House Bill 115, go to the regular calendar after engrossment. Without objection, House Bill 20 and House Bill 115 of the regular calendar after engrossment. Shall the bills be engrossed and pass the third reading? As many in favor of that motion will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The bills are engrossed and pass the third reading. Continuing with the calendar, House bills on second reading regular calendar. Those bills have been taken by for the day. Accordingly, that completes the calendar. Um, does the uh, clerk have any announcements? Yes, sir, Mr. Speaker. Scheduled for this afternoon, uh, there is a committee a meeting of the Joint Rules Committee, which will meet immediately upon adjournment of the second body, which looks to be the Senate at this point. Um, in the sixth floor speaker's conference room, that will be a brief meeting, it's my understanding. Um, at one o'clock or one o'clock House Appropriations Committee will be meeting on the ninth floor or uh, 45 minutes after adjournment, uh, depending, but they'll meet as soon as the joint rules is finished um, up on the ninth floor of the Appropriations Room. Courts of Justice Committee meeting today has been canceled. However, Courts of Justice Civil Law Sub will meet a half hour after adjournment over in House Room D. Courts of Justice uh, Criminal Law Sub will meet a uh, half hour over in House Room C. The GAB. Appropriations Higher Education Subcommittee will meet at 3 o'clock up on the ninth floor appropriations room. Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from uh, Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. On the higher ed subcommittee, just a reminder that we're doing budget amendments. So if you have one, make sure you online get yourself in the queue because we'd like to get as many done as we can. Appropriations Higher Ed Sub at 3, as the Chairman just announced. Appropriations Transportation Subcommittee uh, will be meeting at, the, at 4 o'clock, um, also in the ninth floor appropriations room. Militia uh, Police and Public Safety Subcommittee number 3 meeting has been canceled. Um, at 4 o'clock, the Transportation Subcommittee number 2 will meet. They'll be in the fifth floor East Conference Room. Agriculture, Chesapeake and Natural Resources Agricultural Subcommittee will meeting at 4.30 in the seventh floor West Conference Room. Um, the Virginia Environmental Renewable Energy Caucus will be meeting at, but will not be meeting at 4.30 today as been previously announced by the chair. Um, the HWI Subcommittee number one meeting, that's been canceled today. Rounding out today's last meeting at five o'clock, the Northern Virginia Caucus will meet in the sixth floor speakers conference room. Looking ahead to tomorrow, Tuesday, January 26th, bright and early, 6.30 a.m., the Sunrise Caucus will meet in the Sixth Floor Speakers Conference Room. Uh, Privileges and Elections Elections Subcommittee, that meeting has been canceled for tomorrow morning. At 7.30, the Conservative Caucus will meet in the Eighth Floor West Conference Room. 
Um, at 7.30, uh, the Education's Education Innovation Subcommittee will meet in the seventh floor West Conference Room. Uh, the Bioscience Caucus will meet at 8.30 in the fifth floor West Conference Room, again, over at the General Assembly Building. Then at 8.30, uh, HWI, Health and Welfare Institutions Committee, will meet in House Room D. Likewise, at 8.30 tomorrow morning, Transportation Committee will meet. They will be in House Room C. Um, Health and Welfare Institutions Subcommittee Number 1 um, will meet tomorrow morning immediately upon adjournment of the full committee. Um, and then the Appropriations Elementary and Secondary Education Subcommittee will meet at 10 o'clock tomorrow up in the ninth floor Appropriations Room. Finally, Mr. Speaker, the Democratic Caucus will meet at 11.30 a.m. in House Room 2. The Republican Caucus will meet at 11.30 a.m. in House Room 1. The complete announcements I have at this time. The gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Mr. Speaker, I move from the House adjourned today to adjourn to reconvene Tuesday, January 26th at 12 noon. Gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox moves that when the House adjourned today to adjourn to reconvene tomorrow at 12 noon, as many as favor that motion will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is agreed to. The gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox. Mr. Speaker, I move the House to now adjourn. Gentleman from Colonial Heights, Mr. Cox moves the House to now adjourn, as many as favor that motion will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. That motion is agreed to. The House stands adjourned till 12 noon tomorrow. <laughs>